السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, wish you uh, happy day today and happy weekend إن شاء الله today I have to thank one of my friends on the Facebook his name is أحمد الحيت who suggested that we can have a question and answer session uh, أحمد الحيت is a worker uh, trainer with direct aid in Sudan. Thank you, Brother Ahmed Al-Hayt, and we took your advice. Before we start discussing this, I call it uh, politicization and militarization of humanitarian aid, humanitarian organizations. Okay, let me take you with, a, for, uh, with me in a journey to let us know how the development of human of of the government development agencies in the West. Next one. If we look at this slide, France, Norway, uh, Switzerland, the United States of America, Britain, and uh, da- Denmark and others, those people in these countries respected. Two things. First is the contribution of the citizen of their country whom they went to Africa, Asia, China, Latin America, anywhere to help people whether they are missionaries or not missionaries. And they realized the power and the strength of the soft power of humanitarian response. That's why they took the idea from the individual contribution to make it departments, to make it after that ministries, governmental ministries, and billions and billions and billions of dollars. Why? Because those governments believe in the soft power of the humanitarian work. The French, French development agencies related of, uh, uh, reporting to the Foreign Office of France, and this is 1944, 1944. The Norwegian, Norwegian Agency for Development, it is, when it works outside the country, it is reporting its, its work to the Foreign Office but when it's work with the climate inside uh, Norway, it reports to the, clim- the Ministry of Climate and the Environment. This is 1960. Swiss Development Corporation, 1961. Governed by, governed by the Foreign Office of Switzerland. USAID, 1961 as well, at the time of John Kennedy. Reporting to whom? It's an independent agency, but taking the guidance, taking the guidance of the president, the state department, secretary of state, as well as the national security council. It's not under the government. DFID started as a directorate in 1961, then became a part of the Ministry of Overseas Development Administration, 1970, then became itself Overseas Development Administration, 1997. Then DFID became, DFID in 19, no, sorry, 1997 became a ministry, which is in the, uh, during the uh, Labour government. The NIDA, which is a Danish International Development Agency, re- reporting to the Foreign Office, 1962, second one please, SIDA, Swedish, one, 1965, reporting to Foreign Office. SIDA, Canada, 1968, the, uh, the Parliament, reporting to the House of the Parliament. JICA in Japan, reporting to the Foreign Office. GTZ, the German one, become GIZ, start 1975, but 2011 became GIZ. Okay? and reporting to the Ministry of Economic Development and Cooperation, 
Spanish Corporation as well, 1988, reporting to the front office. Those people believe in the soft power of the humanitarian work. That's why they changed the individual contribution into ministries, departments, and billions and billions and billions of dollars of contribution from the countries. So when we look at their donation to United Nations, or their donation to European Union, or their donation to your organization, of course, it will be governed by their foreign policy. It will be governed by foreign policy, whether we like it or not. You want to become independent? Depend on the individual donor. Two organizations can mention the name today, uh, MSF, Medicine Sans Frontier, as well as uh, World Vision. They said we don't take money from government. They're independent. They are vocal. They can work anywhere. But there is no humanitarian contribution from a government without political aim or policy from such a government. Even when you get some money from certain groups, they put their policy and their political view on the fund they give you. Militarization. Militarization as a question was after Afghan war with the Soviet. It started to be like a question or a, a, an, an era coming from the far west, from America, to give this soft power to the military forces in different parts of the world. This could be a counterproductive, could be extremely serious. Because it, in some cases, in Afghanistan, the rebels in this area were attacking any Western organization from such a country. So you risk the life of the humanitarian worker, you risk the, 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 the existence of the organization. But one of the problems here is militarization in the Arab countries and others is where you get uh, generals, you get uh, uh, brigadiers, colonels to run humanitarian organization. It is absolutely unacceptable. This does not say that we do not respect the military, but it's not their job. The philosophy of understanding the humanitarian work is so vast, so diverse, so inclusive. And the military has superiority, hands-on, order, top-down approach. It doesn't work with the community. Even with the security, which is the police forces, when they run this kind of humanitarian organization, they are microscopic with a suspicion, I, you know why? Because they are always look for criminals. And this is their job. And this is the occupational hazard that we're talking about. So this actually will be quite serious if we actually let this organization, the Italian sector, be run by the security, securitization, or by the military. Okay, second question is, are humanitarian organization having transparent organizational structure all the organizations have their structure. But are we following the structures? I can take you to some of the organization putting the chart, the monogram of the organization. But are we following it? Is any level of this structure have a job description of the department? Job description of the division? Job description of the desk? Not even to say job description of the individual whom we are employing him or her. Quite nice to have this. It's debatable. And I know a lot of organizations, they are beautiful structures. But it's not implemented. And no job description for any level of such a structure. Serious. And this could be everywhere. Or there's a job description but no one is following it. Second one. 
Can the current organizational structures meet the changing needs of the needy and provide a working suitable climate to meet people's and organizational needs? This means high level of thinking, broad-mindedness, not top-down approach, not hands-on policy, not nepotism, or get the people who trust and ignore the people who are vocal. No. If you need to have to, to let your organization to meet the change, the changing need of any community is on the spot. Happening day in and day out. So if you don't have those kind of expert, broad-minded, flexible, visionary, people who can accommodate the opinions of whom? Of the local community. The opinion of whom? Of the local field officer. The desk officer in London and in New York should not behave as a god. The desk officer in Kuwait, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, as a donor or emirate should not behave like a god. The field officer in Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, Palestine, uh, any part, South Sudan, everywhere, is the one who has, should have the upper hand and should be listened to. That's why if we don't have this kind of flexible mind, broad-minded with a vision, we will never be able to meet the needs of the needy. How can you provide a suitable climate if you don't understand what the climate is about? Well, quite often in Europe, well, quite often in the Middle East, as donor countries, we get somebody who can have a PhD, who can have a master. But for me, it's a dead meat. Why? Because they don't understand the climate of work, whether in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and others, needless to say, the organizational humanitarian climate in the headquarters. If you get the wrong people, because they are the, your own friends, or because they are national citizen, you get nowhere. You have, got to, you have to get the best of the community, whether they are national or foreigners. Are there any policies to guarantee the continuity of vibrant response of the organization and keep its viability in the program? This means alternate, alternative leadership. A system should allow a term in office Sometimes the term in office means that I employ somebody for three years, for five years. The board member or the trustees have to serve for three years or four years or five years, one term or two terms. And, and after that, thank you. But we can find in certain organizations that the board members, which are the trustees, serve for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. And to give permanent job to people that you cannot sack or you cannot uh, change. If you want this vibrant organization to exist, you have to train the youngsters from within the system of the organization to make the quality leadership is coming from within, to allow the program to have this voluntarism in the community and to pick and choose the best of the youth after being qualified to do the job and give him the scope to grow and give him the scope to grow and when he or she grow they'll become the best manager the good manager and others send all those youngsters to where not to london not to paris not to kuwait not to jeddah 
not to Dubai, not to New York, not to Washington. Send them to Juba. Send them to Kabul. Send them to Makadishu. Send them to Bamako. Send them to Gaza. Send them to Aleppo. Send them to South Africa. Send them to Kambala. Where those youth become real hands-on leaders. If you want your organization to become vibrant. If you want your organization to become vibrant, uh, you have to get women and youth inside the structure of the organization. Most of the organizations that I know don't have women in the leadership, don't have women in the board, don't have even youth in the board. Here, you will never become vibrant and to be able to respond to the needs of the community. So it is the contribution of youth and women, the, ha the, the field experience, and the connectivity with different communities. Next, please. I mentioned this earlier. Is there uh, organizational plans for leadership change? This should, be, this should be a basic fact in the structure of any organization. At my age now, I will never be able to do what I have been doing 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Never. I was legging, running, flying, going here and there. I was hands-on as a manager to try to be sure that everything is done. Okay? But nowadays, I have to use my expertise to do some other job. If we allow, if we allow the youth to grow, if we give them a space to grow, if we nurture them, if those young qualified people know that in a few years' time they become manager, directors, CEO, and so on and so on, they will stay to become leaders. They should be nurtured and mentored by senior people in the organization. We should spend on capacity building. We should spend on mentoring. We should spend on research. So those youngsters will become the future leader. So we have a program, a budget for future leaders from within the organization. Next, please. Is there, is there a self-sustained local fundraising plans to meet the local needs? Yes, there is. I gave you some examples from different parts of the world. One of the best examples that we can celebrate is Edi. Rahmatullah alayhi may Allah bless his soul from Pakistan. Very simple man. Not from a very wealthy family, from a very simple family. But he had the Edi Foundation. Everybody knows now Edi Foundation. Pakistan and globally. Muhammad Yunus in Bangladesh, another poor country, was Grameen Bank. Muhammad Yunus from Bangladesh. Yes, they managed to do that. We need many Muhammad Yunus. We need many Edi. Rahmatullah Ali. In Egypt, somebody called, uh, uh, what's his name? Mohandis Ismail Limat Urayibda. I can't remember his name now, but uh, he started from nothing. Tafahn al Ashraf. Uh, he was in, in, a, in, a, in a village called Tafahn al Ashraf, and from there he managed to help many, many people with millions of pounds. But I, his name is, is, I can't recall his name nowadays. Those people came from a very poor community. You know why they succeeded? They succeeded because the community trusted them and respected them. The community trusted them and respected them. We want to know why? Because they were honest, sincere believers in their mission. Yes, we can make a local fundraising and sustainable fundraising. In different, you find them in Sudan, you find, but nobody's celebrating their success. 
Found them in Ghana, in Guinea, and everywhere. Everywhere. Promote the success of the local community. Promote the success of the local achievers. Next, please. I'm just looking at the time. It's still about five, ten minutes. Is there self? This is okay. We done. We done this one. And if you want to be self-sustained, depend on the local contribution. No matter how big or small the contribution, and grow slowly, progressively. Slowly and progressively, many people in Pakistan, in India, in Bangladesh, in Africa, and China have managed to do it. And they are successful and they are very successful. Next, please. Coming back to the first slide of the uh, soft power till he get the slides back, slide show back. If you want to be an independent organization, as I mentioned, you have to depend on the small contribution of the individual themselves. We show how the West believed in the soft power of their organization. Unfortunately, nowadays, in our countries, from where we came, they closed down the organization. They uh, accused them of becoming radical, of becoming a terrorist organization. That's what the difference between the mentality who run here and who run there. They led the media to trash them. And this is very serious nowadays. They employ people to make a research to find any, any, any suspected mistake which might have been done unintentionally 20, 30 years ago. And here, here we go. And the media will park on you, will bark on you. Will bark, not park, will bark. How, 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 how on you. Coming back to the presentation, what is the role of donor organization from rich countries? Only to meet the humanitarian need of the people or to develop the local community or to invest in human resources. Most of the organization from the East, the donor country, unfortunately, 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 fit the first one. The humanitarian response, emotional response, no planning, no long-term vision. I can give you an example. The famine in Somalia in 2011, let us all of us to call for building wells. Building wells is a short term. It's not a long term. And it takes the water from the reservoir of the land, or the reserve of the land, from the reserve of the land. The real, the real development program for the trout is to build dams. Every year, it trains in this area, and billions of cubic meters of water go to the ocean because we don't have dams. And this is the humanitarian needs for the moment. Emotional. Today is Somalia, tomorrow something else. Yalla. Carry on, carry on, carry on, carry on. As we are dealing with the lives of people as carry on boys or carry on girls. The second, develop the local community. I challenge many organizations, whether they are from the West or from the East, to apply the second one. Well, still, this local community is depending on the donation of Western and Eastern organizations. Because what we have nowadays is humanitarian colonialism. Humanitarian colonialism. You have to stretch your hand. I gave you the hand out. I don't give you the technology. 
That's why one of the outcome of the World Container Summit June this year, uh, last year was, is localization, localization, localization. And this is long-term investment is developed directly. The second one, invest in human resources. Whether this human resource is in your country or in the poor country. You can't keep some, uh, some employees working for you for 20 years without any training. Then you sack them when the new management come and say, yes, go home. You are a waste of time. I'm not a waste of time. You are the waste of time. You know why? Because you gave me the job 20 years ago and you never trained me. You never advised me. You never actually developed me. So invest in human resources, develop local community, as well as meet the need. And you have to divide the cake from the day one at the time of a material response. You don't spend all the money that you have on handout or humanitarian response. But you have to get about 25 to 35% of this at the time of emergency on the development local community as well as human resources. Okay? Next, please. What is the organizational capital? Technology, advancement. What's the second one? Quite a few. Ah, there are three. There are three. I think he did not try the other two. Technology, advancement, financial growth, or field work experience. Technology is something that you can buy, but you might not be able to use. You might not be able to use. Many, org many rich organizations have got the top technology in the rooms, and they show it as a piece of show to the visitors. And they took a photograph with it. Unless you know how to use the technology, don't buy it. It's number one. It's a part of the capital. The second one, financial growth. Yes, it is. It's an indicator. It's an indicator, but it's not a growth. Because growth must be multidimensional. One of which is the financial growth. People sometimes keep saying, yes, yes, we are, we are 20 million last year, we are 30 million. Ha, ha. Yeah, but what is your mentality and your intellectual capability? What's the strength in your program? In the field and in the HQ. Field experience is the top. So if we look at the three of them, field experience, which means that you have a strong program. You have community buying in of your program. You have delivered a product to the community that the community is actually happy with it. It's number one. This, we can achieve this one even with less resources. I remember the good old days, 35 years ago, or 33 years ago, 34 years ago, when we have no money in Islamic Cliff. We also no resources. But we managed to start with the seed of the idea in Sudan, in East of Sudan, in Bangladesh, in Malawi, and let it grow. And the resources came later on. So to conclude today, why I call this question and answer session politicization and militarization is about values, about principles, and about moral morality. So thank you very much. Uh, for being with me today. Tomorrow, inshallah, the same time, we'll do it in Arabic. Ghadan, inshallah, tkun al kalima ta'at al huwa tasyis wa askarit al mu'amal al insani. We, al su'al wal gawab lina ghadan, inshallah, sa'a 11 wa nusta wa it Mecca, sa'a 11 wa nusta wa it London, 1 wa nusta wa it Mecca. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.